So it's my pleasure now to announce our second uh, Swiss speaker of uh, the morning, Dr. Claudia Gamondi. She actually comes from Italy and she works in the Italian speaking part of Switzerland. So uh, you have here three people from Switzerland today working in three different parts of Switzerland with three different languages, three different cultures. I can tell you it's actually three different countries. Um, and uh, uh, Claudia uh, is a palliative care physician. She um, is the sort of the, the big chief of palliative care in Ticino, uh, the Italian speaking Canton with about 350,000 people. And she is also, um, um, she has a research interest in assisted suicides uh, and uh, she performs her research uh, with a base also at the University of Lausanne and uh, at the University of Lancaster in the UK. And she will talk to us today about relatives' experiences in assisted suicide decision making in Switzerland. So good morning everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. Beautiful city and beautiful country and beautiful and very interesting Congress. Um, yes, I will talk about families or I will talk about what we don't know about families mostly because I think it's a very underestimated um, research issue on assisted suicide and uh, I will focus mainly on assisted suicide and not on euthanasia because um, I mainly focus in Switzerland, my research, and the few data I could found uh, were mainly related with um, the Oregon data. And uh, we will try to depict uh, how families are involved in assisted suicide, uh, which problems are there, and try to derive some conclusions. Um, I think that assist, I, I basically, start from this picture because I think that assisted suicide is a kind of iceberg. So this is the patient request. So I want to die, please help. But then there is an underlying very big negotiations and discussions that don't actually start when the patient asks, but they can start years and years before, at least within the family. So I just divided into uh, the negotiations of the patient uh, can be with the right to die association, can be with the healthcare system. Basically, in Switzerland, it's about certification and prescription. And uh, we will focus mainly on these family uh, negotiations. So, so we will go through the negotiations with the, the patient, the interactions that family members have with the healthcare system. Then I will try to depict some interactions with the right to die associations uh, and the few things we know about grief and bereavement. What we know is thanks to mainly Linda about families uh, and um, she depicted already in 2006 uh, that uh, uh, families were, let's say, not surprised uh, very often from the request of the patient because uh, it, it belongs to a long-standing biography normally, this, uh, this request. And, uh, and families were at least uh, appeared knowledgeable about their loved one's political views, uh, but less aware of the actual interest. So they were, uh, some of them were surprised by the fact that the patient was asking. And uh, we know that uh, um, patients lived in their families for long periods of time. And we know that there are some hypotheses there that patients have a particular uh, attachment style or could have a particular attachment style. And so this af affects uh, their relation that they have within the family for years and years. What we know for families uh, in Switzerland, at least we know that uh, um, they, um, Wagner did two quantitative studies. Uh, she uh, sent uh, questionnaires uh, to family members that were involved in assisted suicide death in the German speaking part. So these are data coming from the German speaking part and not from the Italian and not from the French speaking part of Switzerland. And that can make a lot of difference. And basically she uh, concluded that there are some issues of post-traumatic stress disorders and complicated grief 
And actually, she concluded also that the disorder that she observed it could be related to the experience of forensic investigations. We have to make a step back and say that since assisted suicide is not really legal, it has to be announced to uh, the police. And after the patient's death, the police comes to the house of the patient where the family is and the right to die volunteer normally is, and they make a quick or not that quick investigation about what happened. So her supposed, her hypothesis was that experiences, the forensic investigation could lead to the post-traumatic stress disorders that she um, observed in her studies. What we did, it was a completely different um, study that we, uh, we interviewed patients, family members of bereaved, um, uh, that were bereaved after assisted suicide. And uh, I am coupling here two different studies uh, because I, I did the pilot studies and these are published data and these are new data that we are trying, we are now preparing for publication. So I, I will try to summarize both of these studies. So the first studies were with very few numbers of relatives associated with some few patients. So the interviews were with some family members related to one patient, so we were able to make a kind of triangulation of experiences on the same cases. And in the French-speaking part, here we have two interviews in the Italian-speaking part, so they are mainly data coming from the French-speaking part. And we were able to interview, as you see, many family members derived from the same experience and we are analyzing data. These are the themes that we explored in the interviews. So we were asking why the patient was asking uh, for assisted suicide, how the family negotiated with the patient, the healthcare professionals and the right to the association, this decision making, how was and the day the death happened and how they perceived the role of the palliative care team uh, my interviews in the Italian speaking part were all done with family members that were followed by a palliative care team, at least in the last weeks of life of the patient, whether the French speaking data do not come from palliative care settings. Uh, but we asked anyway about palliative care because they knew about and some family members from the French speaking part also came across uh, palliative care in their decision making. And uh, we were interested about disclosure of assisted suicide. Did people talk about uh, what were uh, going through during decision making and after the death? And uh, in general, their views about their own experience. What we were able to derive it was that uh, um, we, we tried to depict their in type of involvement and we saw that half of them had a kind of passive involvement. And for passive involvement, we mean uh, that the family member interviewed were not completely in agreement in terms of the values that were bringing the patient to assist the suicide. So they, they were challenged in their Yes, in their moral values from assisted suicide and participating in assisted suicide where half of the interviewed were not challenged at all by this. So they were completely in agreement with the concept that assisted suicide was a completely acceptable procedure. And most of them told us that it was a kind of right, a citizen right that the patient has in Switzerland, so they were just accessing something that was completely normal and uh, in, in, in agreement with their basic values and biography. So as you can see, and there, there is a kind of splittage between 50 and 50 of the uh, positions of the family and uh, the type of involvement uh, uh, were clear if they were they had a passive involvement if they didn't share uh, the values so they struggle a lot uh, in participating in assisted suicide they had major um, dealing problems uh, with uh, um, 
the moral dilemma that this created for them. On the other side, half of the family members were not at all challenged by this and they had less moral dilemma and they solved the few dilemma much quicker than the passive involvement of family members. So we saw many uh, family members dealing with moral dilemmas during the decision making phase and basically we can relate everything to the can I help or can I kill my beloved one? So that was the main question that the family members were asking themselves during and after the decision making. So can I participate in this killing? And they were mostly solved and quicker solved by the uh, active involvement of family members. The passive involvement uh, were struggling much more and uh, we had data that family members six years after the death uh, still struggle upon these moral issues uh, that they faced. We found also that they treat uh, with secrecy the assisted suicide and uh, uh, what we found in the Italian speaking part, uh, that is Roman Catholic mainly, is that they really don't tell anybody and uh, they don't tell during the decision making and they don't tell after. So they tend to really keep it secret and precisely tell to whom to tell and decide to whom to tell in a very cautious way. While on the French speaking interviews you can see there is a little more openness in talking and we can conclude that they definitely choose secrecy as a, a, a really a personal choice and it's not a consequence only of the fears of stigma that they can have. The, we, can, we found also that there are issues of isolation in these family members, but what was interesting that we hypothesized that in the Italian speaking part this was due to the system, so family members are isolated by the system of assisted suicide, while from French speaking interviews we can then observe that the isolation is mostly chosen by these people. It, it is not the consequence of participating in assisted suicide, but it's a way they choose to participate in assisted suicide, which is quite different from the uh, original Italian speaking part interviews. And what came out really clear is that they perceive assisted suicide as a very intimate and private issue. So they perceive this as a family issue and not at all a medical issue. So they don't like at all, and I will show you then the results, they don't like at all that physicians are too much involved in this, uh, um, in this process. Uh, these are some quotes uh, just to demonstrate uh, you what uh, I said. As you see, is uh, this lady said it is or it was a personal problem, it, and I had to digest by myself. Um, some family members uh, told me, "You are the very first person I'm talking to about what I lived, and two to five years has passed now." So I. I really faced uh, a lot of uh, um, careful cho choice uh, into whom to talk about assisted suicide. What do we know f about interactions uh, with the healthcare system? And I just made this uh, um, colored picture to strike the difference. We have some US data that say that families and patients expect from the healthcare system during assisted suicide decision making that physicians and in general the professionals are very open in talking about assisted suicide and they ask for expertise in explaining the dying process and they ask to preserve the relation even if the physician or the nurse is in disagreement. What I found uh, on the other side in Switzerland uh, is that uh, they mainly treat uh, assisted suicide issues with secrecy, so there is not at all any openness in talking. And there are uh, loads and loads of misconceptions about medicine and mostly about palliative care. So they believe that palliative care is uh, opening the drip of morphine, making people unconsciousness and unable then to uh, make their own decisions, so losing their control, so they really fear palliative care because they have misconceptions about this, and uh, 
there are issues, as I said, of isolation that is on some parts are chosen and some other parts is really wished and looked for by the patients and the family. And that uh, assisted suicide is perceived as a private right. Uh, and so they are not uh, really interested in preserve the relation if the physicians show any disagreement, but they just go to another physician to find their way through the system of certifications and prescription. So there are quite uh, different uh, cultural issues in the perception of the healthcare system. What do we know about the interaction with the right to die association? As far as I know, nothing, basically. I couldn't really find uh, good research in how family members interact with the right to die associations. Uh, what we know from the daily practice is that uh, it depends very much on the association, very much on the, um, on the volunteer of the right to die association. So some family members are included in the decision making, so they are there when the patient talks with the uh, right to die association volunteer some others are not present at those talkings and mainly what i know from the french speaking part is they rather prefer that the family is at least informed so the right to the association asks that he, uh, that is informed and georg data show that in the german speaking part most of the family were at least informed of the decision of the um, of the patient, but how they really interact. Do the right to the association care about these families? Uh, do they talk to them? Do they go through the moral dilemma? We actually don't know. And this is a good field of research, I think. And what we do we know quickly about the grief and bereavement? Uh, mainly we have um, an, a very old speculation based uh, theory that uh, is uh, depicting three different cases, so better try to depict three cases when um, there are some conflicts, uh, religious conflicts within the family and the patients during decision making, uh, or a, a, a second type of case where there is absolutely op opposition from the family for the patient decision, or when the family tend to uh, propose assisted suicide directly to the patient. And she concludes, uh, she, she makes some hypotheses uh, saying there could be fears, uh, stigma, and uh, um, difficult issues during the bereavement uh, after assisted suicide. But she published this uh, in, in, in years where assisted suicide was not at all happening, and so it's just a, a theory that we could confirm or not. Uh, what we know is uh, from quantitative studies from the Netherlands uh, and uh, Oregon data that show that, uh, um, well, Swarte published on, mm, on euthanasia and uh, Linda published on assisted suicide, which I think that could be different in terms of bereavement also, because there are different uh, decision making involved, I think, in, in euthanasia and decision making. But basically, um, they saw no big issues in um, in uh, in the bereavement in the families, but uh, they hypothesize that uh, by being open in the dialogue and by being clear on the process, that helped a lot of the families uh, to deal with assisted suicide. But this is not uh, what we found, at least in the moment in Switzerland, because they treat this with secrecy and isolation. So could be that we face two different populations and two different problems. So um, what should I um, advise when we deal with assisted suicide issue is mainly, yes, there is the patient there, but don't forget about the family because there are families behind and close by the patient. So. Um, Identify their type of involvement. Do they have a passive of, of active involvement? If you see any moral dilemma, address the moral dilemma or the, conflict, or the, or the conflicts if they are there. I think that as the patient has the right to be informed about risks and benefits of uh, uh, assisted suicide, so families have the same rights. So inform about risk and benefits at, or what we know are there uh, of risks and benefits. And uh, what we have seen is that uh, um, 
we should recognize the family members in disagreement because from our result, uh, they clearly show that family members in disagreement tend to be put really aside the family because they tend to be considered as selfish. You rather prefer dad to be here like this and not be involved, the daddy having what he wants. And they tend to really be uh, put uh, aside within the, the decision making and also after during the bereavement. So these are really particular population of, of people that are not uh, um, really recognized enough. So um, families, uh, they, they do not face assisted suicide as it is the day that happens. But Norwood talks about this euthanasia discourse, which is a, a discourse that can begun, begin 10, 20 years before happening of assisted suicide. Uh, our family members told us, dad asked me to help him 20 years ago. I was 18, one, one lady said to me, I was 18 and dad said, you're going to help me when I will need. And now the time has come to help me. So there are some legacy that are lifelong lasting that we should recognize and we should take into account when discussing about assisted suicide. So in conclusion, relatives can face many challenging issues during assisted suicide decision making and after that are mainly underestimated and undertreated as far as I know. Risk and benefits should be known and should be explained to family members and we should try to recognize their molly dilemma if they have any and try to help them, help them through the decision making phase and the bereavement. And do we really have a role with them? Because as palliative care physician, I can see very clearly that I have a clear role as much as with the patient and as much with the family members. But as far as what is happening now in assisted suicide in Switzerland, where physicians have a very, very few and unclear role, just prescription and certification, do we have the duty of care to these families? And uh, if yes, what kind of duty of care do we have? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claudia. Are there any questions? If not, let me start with a brief question. Um, how much of what uh, you found in your interviews you would presume is linked to the Italian culture in Ticino uh, rather than to the Swiss culture of uh, freedom in decision at the end of life? I think that the second round of interviews are mainly done in the French speaking part. So I think we can rather conclude that uh, what we saw in Ticino is happening also in the French speaking part, but I think they have different reasons behind this. The why is different. The what is a bit the same. So isolation, secrecy are a bit the same, but I think that the whys are very different. On the Italian speaking part, there is much more fear of stigma. So people are really in fear of being pointed the finger, say, you killed your dad, my goodness. On the French speaking part, much less fear of stigma is present, but it's a really chosen isolation. It's a family issue. It is a really family issue, and we deal as we deal with family issues. Viola Schubert Lehnert aus Halle. You were speaking about family members. Yes. Uh, what does this mean in concrete? Yes. Uh, only husbands or wives or uh, cousins we and more and later? Uh, and were uh, there a difference between male and female uh, family members? And last, children also were included from which age they were included? 
So I will try to remember your three questions. <laughs> the first question was uh, um, relatives. We, uh, we interviewed uh, really family members, so husband, wives, nephews, sisters, brothers, uh, and uh, we had also a couple of friends that were really engaged in the care of in the last months of life of the patient. So it is a kind of caregivers in general, so family and caregivers. The second was men, female, no, I don't see any difference. I see basically the difference between does this belong to my biography or not? And uh, third, children. Fascinating, we had some interviews saying, did you say to your children that granddad died of assisted suicide? And they say, oh no, actually they are too young. And then I said, how old they are? Oh, 20 and 25. <laughs> so I was quite amazed by this. And uh, so they tend to keep the secret also within the family, choosing which members of the family tell and why and what and how far. And we had a boy uh, in the French speaking part we interviewed. He was, I, I call him a boy because he was a 22 years old. Um, but basically he had his father died of assisted suicide and two years later his uh, grandmother, so the mother of the patient who died of assisted suicide also died of assisted suicide. So yeah, this man has two relatives dead of assisted suicide and he actually um, integrated these deaths as absolutely normal types of deaths. You can't see. He hasn't witnessed any other death. So two deaths was two deaths of by assisted suicide. So it's this kind of dealing. So I can go on and on. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Claudia, and especially for passing the neuropsychological test uh, of remembering three questions uh, at a time. At my age, I need to write them down, uh, but uh, uh, at your young age, uh, uh, it's uh, really wonderful to see that that can still work. And I will now pass on the mic to my old friend, Orban Wiesing. 